Taking a plane trip is one of the most exciting things I can think of. There's something so joyous about waking up somewhere, hopping a simple flight, and going to bed somewhere completely new. But what happens when your flight doesn't go as planned? Join us tonight to discuss three long unsolved investigations of people who seemed to disappear mid-air. Some puzzles really stand the test of time, inviting curious sleuths from all over the globe to come together in an effort to solve history's greatest mysteries. These are the cases of Frederick Valentik, Amelia Earhart, and D.B. Cooper. Listener discretion is advised. Hello, welcome to the Lost Souls of America podcast. I'm your host, Jamie, and joining us tonight is our beautiful producer, Amelia. Hi, Amelia. Hey, Jamie. How are you? I'm great, thanks. How are you? I'm good. I was listening to your intro, and it reminded me of a conversation I had with my dad. We were talking, and I was telling him how we were going to do this episode, kind of like, you know, a little like palate cleanse, a little step away from like the gore and the sadness of missing people. Uh, victims of murder. Yes. And I was like, we're going to do pilots that go missing. And he's like, they go missing, but there's still people in the plane. And I'm like, no, uh-huh. <laughs> like Amelia Earhart. And he was saying about how there's a very you know, famous, I think it's a series of books. I think it was made into a TV show or something. The Leftovers, which is this book about when the rapture happens and all the saved people go to heaven and everyone else is here, left here on earth. But if your pilot was saved, all of a sudden, no one's flying the plane. Oh, my God. <laughs> and it's such an interesting concept to think about. That's really scary. That's I know. Like, there's a couple TV shows that have like a similar plot. And there's definitely like a Christian movie that has that plot. Yes. I'm pretty sure it has Kirk Cameron in it. Ooh. My husband used to be the manager of a movie theater like back in the day. And they had like a whole christian film fest there and kirk cameron came and that was like it was like a premiere <laughs> it was a whole cool. thing. yeah so hopefully nobody gets raptured anytime soon at least not while i'm on the plane um but yeah you know i i just needed you and i talked and we were like can we can we just not tear our souls out we just need a little break <laughs> i feel <laughs> like Especially because so much of what we've been covering, like, especially the past, like in the beginning, then we kind of got off it for a little while. And now we're kind of at it again is like missing and murdered children, which is just like the most awful thing you could ever think of. And we just, we needed a little, something a little lighter. I cry every week. (laughs) I just needed to not cry just for one week. Um, We'll be back to making everyone cry and, and. Hopefully want to take action next week. But um, I actually just wanted to add before we jump into this, that this episode should be pretty family friendly. I know that I said listener discussion advised. I don't know what you're going to say, Amelia, but I'm not going to say anything that's like supremely inappropriate. (laughs) Um, D.B. Cooper was actually my son Wyatt's request, my eight-year-old. And he helped me research it. And we kind of had a lot of fun learning about him together. And he's really looking forward to hearing the final results. So what do you think, Amelia? Is your is yours okay? I think so. I'm going to really refrain from using any foul language. So that's that's my commitment today. Okay. I'll, I will do that as well. I will do that as well. So if you have inquisitive kids who like weird history like mine, Amelia's going to try real hard not to swear. So go <laughs> grab them and bring them in. Um, I'll edit it out if I do. It'll be fine. We don't swear okay. on Ghost Hunting in New England. We've done a hundred episodes that swearing on that one. Wow. Yeah. Because I think when I co-hosted, you had to edit me a few times. <laughs> I'm trying to make it family friendly. Yeah. It's hard to be, I mean, there's not really much of a need to be family friendly in most of our episodes because we're talking about the most horrific things you can imagine. And I don't want my kids listening. Agreed. Agreed. Yes. Agreed. But this episode is not that way. So I know I'm not the only one sharing stories tonight. So I'll ask, I'll tell you, I'm ready to jump right in. Are you ready to jump right in? I think we should just jump right in. Okay. We begin tonight with the unexplained disappearance of the young pilot Frederick Valentik, who vanished mid-flight over Australia's Bass Strait. 
though this is an international mystery and not a story native to America's airways, we think that you'll find it to be one that has more universal ramifications. You see what I did there? Ooh. <laughs> In October of 1978, Frederick was a 20-year-old pilot who'd been practicing for about two years already with high hopes of becoming a commercial pilot one day. At 6.19 p.m. on October 21st, 1978, he took off from Moribin Airport near Melbourne in a Cessna 182 light aircraft. The journey was one he'd made many times before and one that always went as follows. Frederick would fly west for 40 minutes along the Australian coast, and then at Cape Otway, he would head south over the Bass Strait toward King Island. From somewhere over the Bass Strait, air traffic controller Steve Roby at Melbourne Air Surfaces I said that funny. Melbourne Air Services received a very unusual call from Frederick. Okay, Amelia, which one do you want to be? I will be Roby. Okay. Is there any known traffic below 5,000 feet? No known traffic. I am. It seems to be a large aircraft below 5,000. What type of aircraft is it? I cannot affirm. It's four bright. It, it, It seems to me like landing lights. The aircraft has just passed over me at least a thousand feet above. Roger. And it it is a large aircraft. Confirm. Uh, unknown due to the speed it's traveling. Is there any Air Force aircraft in the vicinity? No known aircraft in the vicinity. It's approaching right now from due east towards me. It, it seems like he's playing some sort of game. He's flying over me two, three times at a time. Speeds I could not identify. What is your actual level? My level is four and a half thousand, four five zero zero. And confirm you cannot identify the aircraft. Affirmative. Stand by. It's not an aircraft, it's... Can you describe the, uh, aircraft? As it's flying past, it's a long shape. I cannot identify more. It's got such speed. It's before me right now, Melbourne. And how large would this, uh, object be? It seems like it's stationary. Uh, What I'm doing right now is orbiting, and the thing is just orbiting on top of me also. It's got a green light and sort of metallic. It's all shiny on the outside. It's just vanished. Would you know what kind of aircraft I've got? Is it military aircraft? Confirm the aircraft just vanished. Say again? Is the aircraft still with you? Uh, it's approaching from the southwest. The engine is, it's rough idling. I've got it set at 2324 and the thing, it's coughing. What are your intentions? My intentions are uh, to go to King Island. Uh, Melbourne, that strange aircraft is hovering on top of me again. It's hovering. And it's not an aircraft. End scene. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) From here, there are four unidentified clicking sounds, and they lose connection with Frederick. And he's never been seen since. No debris. I know. I know. No debris or evidence of a crash has ever been located, even though he was flying over an area very close to lots of land where many experts believe evidence probably should have washed up by now had he plunged into the ocean. Shortly after his disappearance, a man came forward who has decided to remain anonymous for the media. And he says that his family was on a trip and they stopped along the way to admire the views. And along with the beautiful ocean sunset, they noticed a small airplane with a green light hovering above it. Before they could really figure out what they were looking at, the objects flew closer and closer together as they disappeared behind the rocky coastline. Several weeks after that, a professional photographer developed his film and noticed something unusual. Roy Manifold had set up his camera for sunset pictures on the evening of October 21st, but when he was looking back at them, he noticed a strange smudge 
At first, he thought it was just a damaged print, but when he had it looked at by professionals, it was actually determined to be in the photo, not damaged to the paper or the negative or from the developing process. It was further analyzed by American experts who felt that the object in Manifold's photo was most likely to be a large metallic object surrounded in an exhaust vapor cloud more than a mile from where the image was taken. Roy Manifold says that he did not notice anything at all to the naked eye, including the plane. There are many skeptics who have their own theories about Frederick Valentich's mysterious disappearance. Some say he was flying upside down and was confused by his own reflection. I find that one hard to believe personally. Others believe he was blinded by the glow of a distant planet or star and became disoriented. What? Yeah. Do they have like different planets or stars shining down on them in Melbourne? I don't think so. Because I I can't imagine that happening here. I'm pretty sure the earth rotates, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. In 1993, a piece of aircraft similar to his, it was the same type of plane, was actually found washed up on Flinders Island, more than 300 kilometers away. And initially, many thought that finally this was the answer they had been looking for all these years. But both the serial number and the paint job did not match Frederick's plane. And so the mystery is still out of this world. <laughs> But um, what do you think? Well, Jamie, let me be the first to tell you if you don't already know this, there have been an overwhelming amount of UFO sightings in that area of the world. Australia has a huge amount of UFO sightings, especially around Melbourne. And not only that, their UFOs tend to affect people very different than American UFOs. Um, <laughs> yeah, there have been a lot a lot of cases of, um, and I really don't want to say this because I'm pregnant and it's upsetting to me, mm-hmm. but <laughs> there's a lot of womb snatching from aliens. <gasps> where Yes. And it seems to only happen in Australia. I mean, that's really the only place I've really heard of it. Um, you know, obviously my thing is more ghosts and witchcraft, but you know, I, I dabble, I dabble in UFO studies and uh, that's, that's the thing down there. Wow. Okay, what would what would make the aliens treat us in America differently than the Australians? They don't want us. They don't want us. I have thought about this. They and what I think it could be is if we have like multiple types of aliens. Yeah. They could have divvied up different parts of the world. That's my hope. That's all I can think of. Wow, that's crazy. That's really crazy. And now you're just making my mind go crazy with all these like other things that I want to look into. It's like I'm Ooh, do, 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 do. Oh my gosh, I used to work at a group home and we had this one woman that was really really into the Twilight Zone. I loved her so much. Oh my gosh. I took her to a whole Twilight Zone exhibit at the Museum of Science. She's it was it was amazing. And we went to the planetarium. She had like it was we had the best day. But anyway, she was obsessed with the Twilight Zone. And she used to go step beyond, step beyond, step beyond. She would yell it and she would Aww. sing. Um, she would sing the theme song. Like whenever she was happy, that's what she would do, sing the theme song. That's really nice. I know. I miss her. Anyway. So that was my that was my first story for you for the evening. I loved it. And Great story, Jamie. Time. Thanks. My first story, and frankly only story of the evening, is about Amelia Earhart. Fun fact about me, Jamie, I am named after Amelia Earhart in a very roundabout way. I think that's so cute. I'd love to have, did I ever tell you that we considered the name Amelia? No, you didn't. I just remembered it just now because I was fairly quickly outvoted, but I wanted to name why that was one of my names for Wyatt. If he was a girl was Amelia, but we would probably call her Mimi. But anyway, go ahead. I'm auntie Mimi for kids. (gasps) I love it. 
because little kids have trouble saying Amelia. Yeah, my mom used to work in conservation and she was big pregnant with me eating her lunch one day at Amelia Earhart Brook. I was like, oh, what a beautiful name. It is. What a feminist. Aww. Yeah. But anyway, back to Amelia Earhart, who was born in Atchison, Texas in 1897. She took up aviation at the age of 24 and later gained publicity as one of the earliest female aviators. In 1928, the publisher George P. Putnam suggested Earhart become the first woman to fly across the Atlantic Ocean. He did this in part because just one year prior, the famous Charles Lindbergh had made the first ever solo transatlantic flight in history. And as a result of that, Putnam had made a fortune off Lindbergh's autobiographical book, We. So at the behest of him, in June 1928, Earhart and two men flew from Newfoundland, Canada to Wales, Great Britain. The flight won her a just tremendous amount of fame, and Americans were enamored with this daring young pilot. The three of them were honored with a parade in New York City. They were given a White House reception by Calvin Coolidge. It was a big deal. So you might be like, Amelia, that's kind of weird that you decided to bring up that author earlier. Well, I brought it up because not only was he responsible for it, and not only did Amelia Earhart go on to write the book for him and have him publish it, but she married him in 1931. Now, she is always, as everyone who's listening to this knows exactly who Amelia Earhart is, and I'm bringing up the fact she was married because she is a huge American feminist icon. And gosh, don't we all need one now more than ever. And after she was married, she continued to fly, give lectures, pursue her career, do everything under her maiden name. Oh, yeah. 1931. Good for her. Yeah. Yeah. Think about how different the world is and like at the same time, still the same 90 years later, 91 years later. Uh huh. Isn't that wild? Yeah. So on May 20th, 1932, she took off alone from Newfoundland in a Lockhart Vega plane on the first solo nonstop transatlantic fight by a woman. She was scheduled to land in Paris, but was blown off course. And instead her plane touched down in Ireland on May 21st. And it's kind of interesting because it took 15 hours for her to get over there. It was 2,000 miles. And she ended up doing it on the five-year anniversary of Lindbergh's historic flight. And what's really cool is no one else had even attempted this before her. So not only was she the first woman to do it, she's the second person to ever accomplish this, which is pretty cool. That is pretty cool. And isn't that funny to think about, too? Again, when we're talking about like this 91-year difference that she meant to land in France, but somehow ended up in Ireland. Yeah. Like the place just like flew over there. It's so crazy to think about. Imagine, imagine if that just like <laughs> right? accident happened to you. I mean, I guess that Columbus made a pretty big oops a daisy. So, I mean, it yeah. happens, but. <laughs> Could be worse, right? Ireland's cool. It's fine. So she did this. She got the flying cross by Congress. And three months later, she became the first woman to fly solo nonstop across the continental United States. Okay. So May 1937, Earhart goes to Miami, Florida with her navigator, Frederick Fred Noonan, where she would make her second around the world attempt. You see, the first one had been made three months prior in Hawaii, but the plane's wheel malfunctioned almost immediately became damaged during their emergency landing that they had to do. So they left. Yeah, I know. Right. So they leave Miami on June 1st. They stop in South America. They stop in Africa, India, Southeast Asia, and they arrive in New Guinea on June 29th. So about 22,000 miles of the journey had already been completed at this point, and they only had 7,000 miles left. That's going to be over the Pacific Ocean. So their next destination was this tiny little island called Howland Island, which was U.S. owned. And it was just like a couple miles long, like a really small little place. The U.S. Department of Commerce had a weather observation station and a landing strip on the island. And the staff was ready with fuel and supplies and kind of everything they needed. They were totally expecting her to go. So it was all on plan. So several U.S. ships, including the Coast Guard Cutter, Itaca? I don't really know how to say that. I-T-A-S-C-A. I- it's Itaca? I don't know. 
I guess it doesn't really matter that much. But they were there and they were deployed to aid Earhart and Noonan for this kind of difficult landing they were going to have to do in this like difficult part. I mean, they'd never flown over the Pacific before. So as she's approaching Howland Island, Earhart radios into the ship, the Itseka, Itseka, I don't know, and explained that she was low on fuel. But a couple hours went by and there were different types of attempts. Two-way communication was only established briefly. And the ship was unable to pinpoint the plane's exact location or offer them any kind of navigational information. Earhart circled the ship's position, but was unable to sight it. So the ship started sending out miles of black smoke to like get her attention while she was in the air. Because they're like, we can't see you even though we're right over you. Oh my God. This reminds me of the Brandon Swanson episode where his parents couldn't find him. <laughs> and he was yes. That's so yes. So they still can't see her. She radios in finally, because again, they can't really hear her either. One half hour fuel and no landfall. So later she tried to give some more information on precision, but it wasn't going through. And then they lose contact. They assume she has landed in the water. If this had happened, no real problem because the two could have escaped using an inflatable raft that was kept on the plane. So like some Sully Sullenberg action of just like gliding into the water, hopping out, getting on a boat. But people were searching for days and there was no sight of anything. So even though you might not have seen them, you probably would have seen a plane floating, right? Something. So there are many, 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 many theories about what has happened. It's been almost 100 years and people are constantly looking at this. It's still so historic to this day. And the first is the castaway theory. And in fairness, I probably should have put this last because this is actually the one I think it is. I don't know why I decided to open it. But in her last radio transmission made at 8.43 a.m. local time on the morning she disappeared, she reported flying on the line 157.337 running north and south, a set of directional coordinates to describe a line running through Howland Island. In 1989, an organization called the International Group of Historic Aircraft Recovery, TICARD for short, which is like a weird acronym, TICARD. <laughs> so they launched their first expedition to Nukamaroro, a remote Pacific atoll that is part of the Republic of Kiribati. TICAR and its director, Richard Gillespie, Believed that when Earhart and Noonan couldn't find Howland Island, they continued south along 157-337 line. Some 350 nautical miles and made an emergency landing on Nicomaroro, then called Gardner Island. According to this theory, they lived for a period of time as castaways on this tiny uninhibited island where, of course, they eventually died. So U.S. Navy planes threw over Gardner Island on July 9th, 1937, just a week after Earhart's disappearance, and saw no sign of Earhart, Noonan, the plane, nothing. But they did report seeing signs of recent habitation, even though it was reported that no one had lived there since 1892. Oh. So 42 years prior. Wow. Well, what did they find? Do you know? Do you know? Well, in 1940, British officials retrieved a partial human skull from the part of the island. A physician subsequently measured the bones and concluded they came from a man. Somehow the bones got lost, though, which is really, really weird. (laughs) But Tigard analyzed their measurements in 1998 and claimed that, in fact, they most likely belong to a woman of European ancestry of around Earhart's height of five foot seven. In 2018, a forensic analysis of the bone measurements conducted by anthropologists from the University of Tennessee showed that the bones have more similarity to Earhart than to 99% of individuals in a large reference sample. Wow. Yeah, that's a lot. (laughs) So that's what I mean. Like at this, that seems to me like the most likely theory. So there's a competing theory argues that when they failed to reach Howland Island, Earhart and Noonan were forced to land 
in the Japanese-held Marshall Islands. According to this theory, the Japanese captured Earhart and Noonan, took them to the island of Saipan, some 1,450 miles south of Tokyo, where they tortured them as presumed spies for the U.S. government. And they later died in custody. Maybe they were executed. No one knows. So since the 1960s, the Japanese capture theory has been fueled by accounts from Marshall Islanders living at the time of an American lady pilot held in custody on Saipan in 1937, which they passed on to their friends and descendants. Some of the theories advocates suggest that Earhart and Noonan were in fact U.S. spies and their all-around world mission was a cover-up effort to fly over and observe Japanese fortifications in the Pacific, blah, blah, blah. But at the time, it's more than four years before the Pearl Harbor attack. Japan wasn't an enemy yet of the United States. Right. So, like, why would they do that? Some claim that Earhart became a Tokyo Rose. Have you heard of this before, Jamie? No. I have heard the spy theory, but I have not heard what you just said. I have not heard of it either. A Tokyo Rose, Tokyo Rose broadcasts were how allied troops referred to female English speaking radio broadcasters of Japanese propaganda. So there was a rumor that Earhart was one of these women after her disappearance. Putnam and I don't know, (laughs) but Putnam investigated this claim personally. Her husband, obviously, he wants to find her. He would just listen to all these broadcasts. And he said he didn't hear her voice once. That's so sad. It's really upsetting. Oh, so, Jamie, this is a really weird one. Some people have suggested that Earhart didn't die in Saipan after her capture, but was released and repatriated to the United States under an assumed name. Beginning in the 1970s, some proponents of this theory argued that a New Jersey woman named Irene Bolem was, in fact, Amelia Earhart. I've heard that before, that there that that theory that she came back. Well, Bolam herself vigorously denied these claims, calling them a awful, poorly documented hoax. This is a real woman. It's not like it's not like, oh, Amelia Earhart's like Irene Bolam, but no one's seen her in 10 years. It's like, no, Irene Bolam existed and was harassed her entire life life about this and it <laughs> she died in 1982 and, and like you said you've heard this before to this day people still think she was Irene Bola Irene Bola <laughs> poor lady and it, it the original reference came in this book called Amelia Her Lives by this guy Joe Klaas and no one knows why he wrote that why he thought that like oh. poor Irene Maybe she did something to him and he was trying I, to That must be it. Like, did she, like, break his heart in high school? Like, huh. Listen, I'm not saying I'm Wonder Woman. All I'm saying is you've never seen us in the same room together. So, <laughs> so since 1989, Tigar has made at least a dozen expeditions to Nicomororo, turning up artifacts ranging from a piece of metal possible airplane parts, a broken jar of freckle cream. What? Why but there's there still white people products in Exactly. <laughs> there's still no proof that Earhart's plane landed there though. And I like got weirdly hung up on this. I'm like, you know, this girl is such a woman. I'm sorry, I can't even believe I said that. This woman is such a boss. She's like the most famous woman in the entire country at the time. She's, you know, all this stuff. Her plane crashes. Why is she bringing freckle cream with her on the boat? And then I thought about it more, Jamie. And I'm like, you know what? Like, if I crash, I'd like grab my lipstick, right? Like, just like yeah. grab all my whatever I had in the plane with me and take it. So it does make sense. So anyway, there's this ongoing controversy spanning, obviously, more than 90 years of debate among researchers, among historians, the crash and think. The crash and sink theory remains the most widely accepted explanation of Earhart's fate. And that theory is obviously that the plane crashed into the ocean and they all sank. Yeah. But over three expeditions since 2002 by deep sea exploration company called Nartikos that used sonar to scan the entire area off of Howland Island near where Earhart's last radio message came from covering, excuse me. 
2,000 square nautical miles, that's a lot of place to scan. It is a lot. Has not found any trace of any wreckage at all. Hmm. None. There's, they, no, there's no plane under there. Have they ever sonared? I don't know what the verb for sonar is. Have they ever done that on or around Nicomororo? I don't know. I don't think so. They should. Let's let's get it. Hey, does anyone want to start a fund? I'm just kidding. So our call to action this week is start a fund. <laughs> our call to action this week is with, let's let's all get a group. Actually, hold on, hold on, hold on. Now that I'm looking at it, they covered 2,000 square nautical miles, but this other island was only 350 nautical miles away. Oh, so they probably did. Yeah. It's the story of the disappearance of Amelia Hart. And obviously there are more theories. I just went with like the like top four, right? People yeah. say she was abducted by aliens. People say all kinds of crazy <laughs> stuff. So that's that's the big the big couple. That's good. And I, I've always leaned toward the crash and sink theory, but I think the Nick Mororo theory, the castaway theory has some weight. I think it has. Oh yeah. Weight. Oh yeah. The freckle cream really did me. Yeah, for sure. Can I, oh, you know what else I wanted to say? I didn't know until I was like doing some research recently, or maybe I knew, but I just totally forgot that there was also a guy with her. Anybody ever talks about her? That's all anybody ever talks about is her. I know. They never talk about the navigator, Fred. Yeah. Fred Noonan. Some other guy went missing too. Poor Fred Noonan. Yeah. Maybe she ate him. Maybe he ate her. That's true. (laughs) This just took a dark twist. Okay. Last but not least, I want to talk about the mysterious fugitive known as D.B. Cooper. Let me read for you what the FBI has to say about this infamous investigation. On the afternoon of November 24th, 1971, a nondescript man calling himself Dan Cooper approached the counter of Northwest Orient Airlines in Portland, Oregon. He used cash to buy a one-way ticket on flight number 305 bound for Seattle, Washington. Thus began one of the great unsolved mysteries in FBI history. Cooper was a quiet man who appeared to be in his mid-40s, wearing a business suit with a black tie and white shirt. He ordered a drink, bourbon and soda, while the flight was waiting to take off. A short time after 3 o'clock p.m., he handed the stewardess a note indicating that he had a bomb in his briefcase and wanted her to sit with him. The stunned stewardess did as she was told, opening a cheap attache case. Cooper showed her a glimpse of a mass of wires and red colored sticks and demanded that she write down what he told her. Soon she was walking a new note to the captain of the plane that demanded four parachutes and $200,000 in $20 bills. When the flight landed in Seattle, the hijacker exchanged the flight's 36 passengers for the money and parachutes. Cooper kept several crew members, and the plane took off again, ordered to set a course for Mexico City. Somewhere between Seattle and Reno, a little after 8 o'clock p.m., the hijacker did the incredible. He jumped out of the back of the plane with a parachute and the ransom money. The pilots landed safely, but Cooper had disappeared into the night, and his ultimate fate remains a mystery to this day. That is directly from the FBI, and I thought it was so eloquently written that I just wanted to read it. Wasn't that, like, nicely worded? That was, yes. So the legend of D.B. Cooper has been one that's captivated multiple generations now. People have been desperate to know who the man truly was, what happened to him when he jumped out of that plane, and, of course, where the money went... The legend has been covered in books and on TV adventure shows, and it's even been written into movies and shows as a bit of pop culture reference. For example, did you ever watch that show Prison Break? No. 
it has Wentworth Miller in it. I want to say that's his name. Um, and they believed that one of the guys that was like escaping with them, that was in prison with them, this nice old man, they thought that he was D.B. Cooper. And so some Whoa. of them really, Yeah, it was just cute. I mean, obviously it's not true, but it was cute. After more than 50 years, what do we know about this mystery today? In 1980, a boy on the banks of the Columbia River in Vancouver was preparing a bonfire on the beach with his family when he scooped his hands into the sand and unearthed three bundles of deteriorating $20 bills, a total of $5,800. Incredibly, the serial numbers on the cash matched the ransom money given to Cooper on the plane in 1971. Whoa. I know. To this day, it is the only money belonging to Cooper that has ever been located. But even how the cash landed on that beach in the first place is a hotly debated piece of the puzzle. Did it wash ashore, drifting for years after Cooper crashed into the water after his jump? Or did he bury it for safekeeping? And where's the rest? In 2020, a new study was conducted on the money that analyzed the, I guess, atomic makeup of the algae particles on the money. The conclusion of that study was that the money did not go into the water at the time of the hijacking. It had been in the water much later than that, meaning it could not have fallen into the water in a parachute crash, which leads many to believe that this is evidence that Cooper maybe made it out alive. According to Expedition Unknown, D.B. Cooper's case is still the only unsolved skyjacking in history, and it may just be up to the people like us, or I guess more like the thousands of dedicated Cooper-obsessed civilian sleuths that are out there, In 2016, the FBI officially declared the government was done with the D.B. Cooper investigation and that no further funds would be allocated to solving this great American mystery. So who was Dan Cooper and what became of him and his money? Let's take a look at some of the popular theories. One thing that many people find surprising when they first dig into this case is that the man himself never used the name D.B. Cooper. He purchased his ticket under the name Dan Cooper, but someone in the media mistakenly, and has since admitted it, used the word D.B. And it stuck. Can you believe that? Did you know that? I did not know that. That is wild. I know. That's my big, like, fun fact that you can tell at parties now. D.B. Cooper wasn't his real name. Next time it comes up in conversation in your everyday life. So Jeffrey Gray, who's the author of the book Skyjack, he says he has the only copy of the FBI's sealed case file on the Cooper investigation. He's not sharing his sources, obviously, but he does say that he has a theory on the name. He believes that the Skyjacker named himself after a comic book character from the time period named Dan Cooper. And if you look at a picture, if you look at the comic book, on the cover, Dan Cooper is jumping out of a plane. Whoa, cool. Mm Mm-hmm. Another common misconception, at least according to Gray, is that Cooper wasn't the like swanky, suave, cool man that the media portrayed him to be. According to statements from the closest physical witness, another passenger sitting on the plane near him, his suit wasn't, you know, if you look at the um, the sketches that they release of it, his, his suit in the sketches is this like man in black style, all black uniform with um, glasses on. This guy said that his suit was actually like a cheap polyester brown tacky 70s suit. In fact, he actually left his tie behind, which, by the way, his tie was black. And it was proven to be a cheap clip on from J.C. Penney. Scientists have since analyzed that tie and they found DNA which I didn't know that until I was investigating this either. I had no idea. I couldn't believe that. Though a match has never been located, right? It's hopeful to know that there may be a potential end to this mystery someday. Genealogy, forensic applications have gained a lot of momentum, obviously. I was so, just going to say that. Throw that on 23andMe. I know. Like, can can we get can we get somebody in on this? Othram, where are you at? Parabon, somebody, let's go. 
but I feel like maybe it's only a matter of time before his family at least is located. One of the more popular suspects was a man named Richard Floyd McCoy. Less than five months after Cooper's infamous skyjacking, McCoy was arrested by the FBI for a remarkably similar case. He hijacked another plane. However, a thorough investigation has ruled him out as a suspect. According to one source, my eight-year-old son, who has done his own independent research on the matter, (laughs) the FBI believes him most likely to be a copycat skyjacker. And one of the primary reasons for this theory is that McCoy was a young man himself in his early 20s, I guess. So Cooper's description was that he was someone significantly older in his 40s. But there are still a lot of the amateur detectives out there who disagree with the FBI's finding, and they still think that it's totally possible that McCoy was the real D.B. Cooper. Another suspect was a man named Robert Rackstraw. Robert Rackstraw, a trained military veteran with parachute experience and a penchant for getting himself into trouble with the law. The FBI ruled him out early on, but in 2018, another military veteran claimed that he'd, I guess, decoded some secret messages that were implicating Raktra, and that Raktra himself had always been really cryptic about the case, never really denying it. Lynn Doyle Cooper was another man considered a suspect when his niece reported that he was bragging about his money troubles being over because he had hijacked a plane. But I do believe... Womp womp. I know. (laughs) I do believe that he has since been ruled out because of the DNA. Well, that's good. I feel like it would be too easy to find a guy whose last name was Cooper. Yeah. That other guy must have robbed another plane. Yeah. A lot of plane thefts going on back then. (laughs) I guess so, right? But Josh Gates said it was the only unsolved one, so who knows? Yes. Thank you for citing his name because I forgot. I couldn't think of it. I am in love with Josh Gates. Are you? I, I'm a huge fan. Big I, fan. I, I did think he had a very nice smile. He's from Massachusetts, too. Stop it. He's from Manchester by the Sea, and he went to College of Tufts. Oh, my God. Yeah. I work I work frequently. I do events and things. I have great connections in Manchester by the Sea. I, I have great connections. Jo- what Josh Gates, I have great connections in Manchester by the Sea. You should use one of those connections to get us to meet Josh Gates. Yeah, if Josh Gates wants to um, get involved with the town of Manchester by the Sea Recreation Department, (laughs) that's those are the only connections I have. But that's pretty good, right? That's pretty. It's a small town; not a lot of people live there. Yeah. Okay. Where was I? (laughs) Whoever he was and wherever he came from, where did he end up? That to me is the part that I find most mysterious. When Cooper jumped out of the plane, the crew marked down the location for officials to search. The area below was thick, dense forests and dangerous rivers. Many people believe that Cooper couldn't have survived the jump. In part, the FBI feels his clothing proved he was ill-prepared for that idea, and the parachutes he were given and the parachutes he was given were not the kind that you could steer to land. It simply was just not the ideal place to jump from an aircraft. And if Cooper was floating down to the wilderness, it's much more likely that he'd have run into major trouble than it is that he'd have made it out alive. Yet since 1971, that area has been searched a million ways by a million different people. That's a rough estimate, not an actual number. And not a single trace of his body, his belongings, or his money have ever been recovered there. Over the years, countless experts in different fields have advocated for what they believe his background to be. The FBI website says that there's no evidence that he had any experience jumping out of a plane, but one former military paratrooper that they interviewed on Expedition Unknown made a pretty good case for the personal theory about Cooper's fate and how it hinges on an alternate jump spot theory. He believes that Cooper walked down the steps in preparation for jumping out of the plane and he committed a fake out jump 
over the location that the pilots noted, meaning he like shook the plane. He hopped up and down a little and shook the plane to make everyone inside believe that he jumped out. But then he really kind of like snuck out gently later in a different location. He also suggests that the FBI's record of the flight path is probably incorrect because he believes that the pilot would have been steering off the commercial path to fly lower and around other airplanes for safety during the whole time that Cooper was in control of the plane and saying that he was going to jump out once he got his money. The show even went so far as to test a much better jump spot closer to Reno and your friend Josh Gates jumped out of a plane for this. Whoa. That's another thing him and I have in common. We both love jumping out of planes. You're crazy. Did you not know that about me? No, I knew that about you. But every time you bring it up, I'm like, oh my God. Actually, my son and I had a whole lengthy conversation about whether or not we could do it. And he's all in. He wants to go tomorrow. I, I, I don't think... I mean, we'll put that off a little because he's eight, but <laughs> I took I my mom. Oh, he my take gosh. You someday. I don't, okay, maybe someday. Okay. Never say never. I believe in that, but I'm not up there. But anyway, Josh Gates jumped out of the plane in a spot that these people were testing and he landed on some nice soft, spongy sand. So I think it's a reasonable theory. That makes sense to me. But why would he like, how would he have been able to fake out all those people? Like, oh, I jumped out of the plane and then go hide. Like, planes aren't that big. What he did was he had them all, because it was like a a flight that was big enough for passengers, you know? So he let all the passengers out and he only kept a few of the crew members. And then at a certain point in the flight, they were, he told them that they were flying to Mexico. And then they said somewhere between wherever it was and Reno. So like before Reno, um, he told them all to go to the front of the plane and he shut the, he closed the curtains in between and he opened the door and this particular plane was one of the ones that had the staircase that goes down. And so you walk down the staircase. And so he walked, they think they didn't, nobody could see him because he made them all go to the front of the plane and close the curtain. So they theorized that he walked down the steps and then the plane shook when he jumped off, you know, like if you, you can imagine how that would like wobble the plane in the air, right? If, when you jumped off the last step. And so the plane wobbled. And so the pilots wrote down that spot where they were. Um, and, or I guess it's in the F, it's allegedly in the FBI file that says that that's the spot where they theorized he jumped off. And so what these people are alleging is that he did like a fake off, like um, hopped up and down on the stairs of the plane and then actually kind of, lowered himself down more gently but who am i to question josh gates yeah i think if i recall he was kind of wishy-washy on his opinion of it all yeah but that's what you do as the host (laughs) right one thing we know for sure the fbi may have put this case to rest but i know this case will not go unsolved forever In my own observations, I think people, for the most part, would prefer to believe that he survived, don't you? Oh, yeah. Wicked. It's a more exciting and intriguing story. Why don't I ask our in-house expert for his final thoughts? What do you say? I say we just bring him on in. Okay. Hi, I'm Wyatt, and um, I think the story is really interesting, and here's what I think happened. Um, I believe that um, we watched a documentary about it, and I believe that he jumped on the stairs a few to- a few times to think that they landed, to think that they landed in that spot, but he really jumped on a completely different spot. And what I think is that I have two theories because in one, that my first one is if he landed and he did land where all the trees was in the forest then i didn't think he'd make it but um i but in the documentary it showed where they think um he he actually landed with the fake fake landing where um they think he really landed and um it looked like he may have survived if he landed there so you think that if he survived, it's only if he landed somewhere else, if there was an alternate landing spot. Uh, yeah. What do you think? Do you think he crashed into the... Do you think he crashed or survived? What do you hope is true? 
I hope he I hope he um never made it, but I actually think he did make it. You did, and you think he stole all the money and ran away with it? Yeah. Thanks, Wyatt. Great job. All right, see you later. I'll be out in a few. Okay. Thanks, dude. Josh Gates and our in-house expert Wyatt both think they fake yeah. he faked the jump. So I do I do have to agree with him in that if if there is a hope of him surviving, then there's no way he jumped where they think he did. I don't know. Come on. Don't come on. I want to believe. Listen, at this point, who cares what's true? What I'm choosing to believe, (laughs) what I'm hanging on to for hope is that he survived and he like stashed the treasure away somewhere and someone's going to find it (laughs) or something. I don't know. I also think he survived because I think they would have found his body by now. Yeah, they would have found something. Anything. You just think he could have survived if he crashed in the mountains like that? Or yes. The river? Really? Yep. But we don't know. We don't know. Dun, dun, dun. Even if they find out who he is, we'll never know what happened. We'll never know. That money was a pretty cool find, though. Well, Jamie, that was a really great episode. I think we learned a lot. I learned a lot. That was fun. Thank you. That was a lot of fun. What a fun episode. We should do more like fun episodes in here. Every once in a while we have to, because I can't, my heart, if you want me to continue doing the other stuff, I've got to do the lighthearted stuff now and then. Yeah, for sure. So anyway, everyone, our call to action this week is pretty simple. We would just really like it. If you would tell a friend about the podcast, Go like us on social media. We're on Instagram and Facebook at Lost Souls of America. And please, please, please be a friend and leave us a five-star review. You can do this by visiting Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Audible, or even on our Facebook page. So again, please go ahead. And if you are so willing, tell a friend and leave us a five-star review. That's all we have for you tonight. Thank you for listening. You can find shareable content on our social media at Lost Souls of America and our website, lostsoulsofamerica.com. Please share often and help spread awareness for their cases. These are the stories of the voiceless. These are the Lost Souls of America.